paper men meet such interesting people. They know the lowdown, now it can be told. I'll tell you quite reliably off the record about some charming people I have known. For I meet politicians and grafters by the score. Killers plain and fancy, it's really quite a bore. Oh, newspaper men meet such interesting people. They wallow in corruption, crime and gore. Tingling ling, city desk, pull the press, pull the press. Extra, extra, read all about it. It's a mess meets the test. Oh, newspaper men meet such interesting people. It's wonderful to represent the press. The Media Project, an opportunity for us to have a half hour of conversation about issues going on in the news media from our perspective, and we hope that you'll join us. My name is Rex Smith. I am a former editor of the Times Union, and I'm here with some longtime veteran journalists, Barbara Lombardo, formerly executive editor of the Saratogian and the Record of Troy, Ira Fussfeld, who was for many years publisher of the Daily Freeman in Kingston, New York, and its affiliated publications. And here's Dr. Alan Shartok, the once and current and future CEO of Northeast Public Radio. Yeah. And former columnist for the Fire Island Times. Um, Fire Island no. Sun. Now you watch it. You know you're doing that on purpose. <laughs> the Fire Island, whatchamacallit. A fine, a fine publication it was. So answer me this, Professor Shartok. Sir. People probably in Fire Island trusted your little publication. They believed what you wrote, notwithstanding evidence to the contrary. But Brand new poll out as we speak from Gallup finds that trust in the news media is four points above the record low in 2016, which was amid the you know the Trump Clinton race, which means it is half the level of trust of the Nixon era, which is when I came of age. Uh, I know you came of age during the presidency of Calvin Coolidge, but this was uh, no, so no, Lincoln. You know, Lincoln, Lincoln, mm-hmm. yeah. So w- overall, 68% of Democrats trust the media, 31% of independents, 11% of Republicans. Ah. So is there a solution to this, Professor? Give us some solutions here. What the hell can we do? Well, if the press would start to lie more and take the same sort of (laughs) lying, 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 lying positions as Trump himself did, then I think you would find some of the Republicans falling in line the same way they do behind Trump. Is that a cynical enough answer for you, Rex? That's pretty good. (laughs) You're probably... You're probably right. You would get that side, but you wouldn't get the others. Ira, you have any, from your wisdom, any solution to the trust gap? Well, I don't know that it's a solution. I I also don't know that we should consider this, and I'm not suggesting you're saying it for this reason, that this is based solely on large media outlets, that the country doesn't trust the media in general because of the big boys. I would tell you that in many respects, they didn't trust us on a local level either, and often with justification, because either you had young reporters who perhaps were a little careless or just needed more experience, and also because at the local level, you often will know the people who are being quoted or cited in stories, and they are not the people who their neighbors know about. In other words, if I run a story and I misspell somebody's name, and everybody in town knows that you idiot, you misspelled the name, yeah. that puts a, a cast a pall on your entire operation. I mean, I had a, a guy who worked with me once, he used to be a UPI reporter, who said I could write the most perfect story in the world, and if I say Washington Street instead of Washington Avenue, that's the only thing people are going to remember because Washington mm-hmm. Street is wrong. So I don't think that distrust is new. I just think it's been more aggressively taken care of because of the, the big boys and particularly on the right. Yeah, and we're beating our breast about it a lot more. Barbara, when you were editing a community newspaper, how did you deal with that issue that Ira is referring to, the question of, you know, young and experienced journalists sometimes make mistakes or they get the tone of something wrong and they try to impress you as their editor by being tough and therefore get a little bit unfair? I think we've probably all had that experience. Did you have any technique for making your journalism trustworthy, I guess, would be the question. I would like to think that I did back then, and sometimes I don't think it was to impress 
the editor, I hope, sometimes new journalists thought they had to be tough and that meant maybe being a little slanted or maybe being a little sensational. Or sometimes it was just the inexperience of not knowing how to explain something that's nuanced, that things are not always black and white. Or it's just the carelessness of, uh, I was actually absolutely right, we have a Washington street in town and when somebody comes in and calls it Washington Avenue, it looks like we don't know what we're talking about. So I, one of the things that I would do is try to ask the reporters how they would feel if this was their name or their parents' name in this story. Would they feel that this story was balanced? And another thing was if they made a mistake, I asked them to contact the person who was wronged and apologize, acknowledge the mistake. And I think that that helps. People make mistakes. People want to be apologized to when they're the victim of a mistake, and it helps to say, I admit that I was wrong. I'm sorry I was wrong. And they could say, hey, they made a mistake, but they admitted it. They were sorry. And then you can move on from there. I think that helps credibility when you can admit that. But don't and you think that a- just, it's that local level because you know that the media makes mistakes. And then there's the larger level because you're hearing people saying that what you're reading is wrong, that what you're reading is a lie. So I think it's, it's a lot bigger than just mistakes on the local level. Well, and on a local level, it's not just the mistakes that Barbara and I are citing. Mm-hmm. If you have a small town and you have a group of four or five friends sitting around having a cup of coffee, you'll find that one of them perhaps is mad at the local newspaper because their son wasn't picked to the all-star team. And you've got another one who is unhappy with how they handled an obituary. And you've got another one who's mad because we wouldn't assign a photographer to a particular event. And Ira, you got another yeah. one who is mad at you for telling the truth. <laughs> Yeah. Well, there's that, but uh, that's easy to defend. The others are harder to defend because, you know, everybody's individual story is the one that's most important to them. And when you have a newspaper making editorial decisions that doesn't quite agree with it, that's another reason why people don't trust or get mad at the newspaper. Yeah, but nobody thinks you got it right. I mean, that's the point. You know, yeah, Once in a while, but not that often. We all know the story of the guy who's in the prison and somebody else out 36 because every joke has a number now that they've told them so many times. So I'll tell mine one more time. Going to a service organization and sitting there and asking them how many of them had a story written about them in the local paper, which Rex might be yours, might not be, and everybody raised their hand, everybody in the room. And then I said, well, how many were happy with it? Nobody raised their hand. <laughs> so, so, you know, people just have a thing there. So I, I know we beat ourselves up a lot on it, but it's the nature of the beast. And by the way, there aren't that many papers left. Right. Papers, TV stations, radio stations, there aren't, uh, th- well, there are, there are thousands, but yeah. uh, uh, there, there are fewer than there used to be. Uh, you know, Barbara alluded to something that I think is really worth contemplating, and that is the nuance of coverage, you know, trying to get the substance of the piece or what's behind the facts is often very difficult. We're seeing that right now on Capitol Hill. And uh, since, Alan, you have a, a Ph.D., I believe, I've heard that somewhere, that you were a professor of political science. Either that, Rex, or uh, you, my mother named me doctor. You know, that uh, that's right. My first doctor. <laughs> so, so tell me, doctor. Actually, I knew a guy whose last name was doctor, and he uh, actually got an M.D., so he was literally doctor, doctor. And then it was case, major, major. Uh, tell us yeah. about horse. <laughs> Horse race coverage. On Capitol Hill these days, there is coverage of the controversy and trying to pass the infrastructure bill, the bipartisan bill, as well as the larger bill that encompasses much of the Biden agenda. John Alsup of the Columbia Journalism Review has written an interesting piece about this where he talks about the horse race coverage as though there are four horses in this race. There are the progressives, the moderates, the Biden White House, and the Republicans. So Who's ahead? Who's not ahead? And the fear being, of course, that these shorthand labels basically dilute the scrutiny. They make it harder for people to fully understand what's going on. But what are you going to do when you have a short amount of time and where you have the controversy? So I guess the question would be, how do you get nuanced coverage when attention spans are short and space and time are at a premium, as they are in in journalism. How would you cover Capitol Hill, Alan, if you were uh, up there every day trying to cover this controversy that's going on? You know, Rex, I might do it the same way, (laughs) despite the fact that there are these issues. You know, uh, right here in New York State, or as they say around here, New York State's one word. In New York State, we have a new governor, Governor Hochul, who 
the establishment clearly is as unified behind as you could see. And there are other people like the very good Tish James, the attorney general, who's really quite wonderful. And a lot of people are expecting her to come in the race. And so you got a lot of this will she or won't she stuff. Then the biggest kahuna of all is the question as to whether the so-called disgrace, and it's something I really wonder about when, as you know, they always say the disgraced Governor Cuomo. That's editorializing in my mind, but the press does it and they do it all the time. He did have to resign, so there's some rationale behind it. But there's a very good chance he's going to come in himself into a five- or six-way primary and that he's going to win. Because, you know, some of the other people aren't as well known and there are an awful lot of people who, who still like Cuomo. I hear from them all the time. So this is the kind of stuff that people can understand. It's not above their heads. And I get it. And if I were running, you know, a news operation, which, of course, I'm not, I would be saying exactly that. I would say give them what they oh, want. That is a problem. So what we're talking about a few minutes ago about the issue on the local level of inexperienced reporters and and harried editors letting things get by without proper context and and nuance. And you see it happening on the national level by experienced people who have much greater resources and much greater knowledge of what they're doing. This is a really big problem, and it disturbs me greatly when I'm hearing that something isn't going to be able to pass, and it makes it sound like, in the case of the infrastructure bill, that this is a failure on the part of the Democrats in power, that it's a failure that they couldn't get everybody together. And that shorthand is a disservice to citizens, not just a disservice to the parties that are wronged and the people that are trying to get things done, but a disservice to the American citizens, and we're dumbing things down. I thought John Alsop was right on target, that the press needs to explain that they're trying to get something done and that people are obstructing it. Not that if we can't get this agreement made, this must be a failure of the people in charge. It is not that simple. And it is explained wrongly a lot of the time. And I think it's a disgrace. Well, I'm not opposed to criticizing the print media, as I've often done on this program. But in this particular case, in this particular issue, I lay this at the feet of the broadcast and the cable news. I would agree that it's broadcast. Now, let's talk about the national level now. So forget about local press, which doesn't cover these things firsthand. But, you know, the New York Times and the Washington Post, which I read every day, had nuance, has described the kinds of things that are not being described more fully by cable and by Internet and the like. Mm -hmm. And so if the setup that Rex gave us... If it is a problem, it's a problem that's created by the news media that, unfortunately, from which most people get their news. If you read the New York Times, it may take you to paragraph 16, but you'll read the kinds of differences that the critics suggest are not being made. And everybody gets to 16. Well, (laughs) well, the broadcast people, on occasion, when they set aside an hour for a special broadcast, they certainly are capable of doing it. But they can't do it within their nor- well, they won't do it within their normal format because people are going to change the channel if it gets too uh, heavy. Yes, that's very difficult because you see the analysis, the benefit of having print and having the stories. For example, you know, what does Christian cinema want? Other than attention, I don't know that we can say what that might be. And that has been pointed out by the best journalists in print. It's very hard to convey that to the general public who is simply looking for results. But if you're watching TV, what you know about Kristen Cinema is that she is colorfully dressed, she changes the color of her hair, and she was followed into the ladies' room by protesters. Those are going to be the images of Kristen Cinema, not what her specific politics are or what is driving her to become such a major figure now in this debt fight. Right. Very difficult decision-making on the part of producers in television, I would think, and the reporters to try to figure out how in the world do we cover this in the amount of time. But I'll tell you, the issue is that cable television, which still reaches an awful lot of people, takes up hours of conversation back and forth, little panel discussions, where the same points are made over and over as though, the way Bernie Sanders puts it, as though this is the Yankees versus the Red Sox. May they rest in peace, the Yankees. 
And it's a difficult dilemma if you are in charge of one of those broadcasts, say, to figure out how you can retain your audience if you don't have your panelists go on and describe it the way they would on SportsCenter. So I'm sympathetic to the journalists. I think it's very difficult. Which uh, journalists? journalists? What's that? Which journalists? You said you're sympathetic to the journalists. And, you know, as usual on the show, there's the usual sour, yeah. sour pusses about the way that the electronic media differentiates. Oh, that's who I'm saying. I'm sympathetic to the difficult plight that they face because their livelihood depends upon the size of their audience. And if you don't have an audience, in any case, your journalism is of limited value. It's a tree falling in the forest. So I, I'm sympathetic to the drive to try to get an audience by keeping your coverage simple enough for the vast majority. I just think that in this instance, it's correct that this moderates versus progressives horse race coverage on Capitol Hill is really problematic. It's the way that we've been covering politics for years and we've tried to get out of it and sometimes we can, but it's now in covering government. It's really problematic. You know, I don't know I don't know that I agree with that. Rex to be as usually provocative as I can. And that is that I truly believe that, for example, who is going to be the governor of New York is important to people. So, you know, when you cover the horse race, you are dealing with what they are thinking about. So that's why I'm not so sure that our complaining about this is justified. Well, but if you have to look at the consequence of who wins the horse race, not just who's ahead and who's not. Absolutely. Um, so what difference would it make uh, whether the governor of New York is Kathy Hochul or Jumani Williams or Bill de Blasio or Andrew Cuomo or any number of people who might be thinking of throwing their head into the ring? What difference would it make? That's really where the coverage needs to be. Well, um, de Blasio is starting to rumor himself into running for governor because he has no other place to go. Being term limited, <laughs> being term limited as mayor, and having a very weak appreciation for his efforts, you know, up to now, and uh, you know, as you always say, Rex, it's one of the things we always quote you on. You say, "Golly gee whiz, Mabel, look at that! Bill De Blasio, a failed mayor, is running for governor of New York. Wants to run for governor of New York. Now, that's important, don't you all think that that's the kind of thing that will get people's attention because uh, they they rated him badly, and now he's going to confound them by running for an even higher office. I've been misquoted. It's golly Martha, not golly gee whiz Mabel. It's golly Martha. Golly Martha. <laughs> the best reporting on that topic is going to do what Rex said. Tell the reader and the listener, the viewer, what does it mean to me? Why should I care which person it is? The best reporting mm -hmm. is going to do that. Not just tell me who's ahead, who's behind, who's running, but what difference would it make to me who that person is? Well, uh, but people have an idea as to, you know, after all, we have elections and the elections give us a leader. And then those leaders are evaluated by the people who are watching or listening. Makes sense to me that they do that and that the press, largely taken, works to give them the information they want about how these people they elected are doing. Media at WAMC.org is how you can share your emails with us, and we'd be very happy to pass that along to our listeners. Media at WAMC.org. This is the Media Project from Northeast Public Radio. That was Dr. Alan Shartok, Barbara Lombardo, Ira Fussfeld, and I'm Rex Smith, and we are grateful to you for being with us. Let us turn to a topic that is of interest to a lot of us who practice local journalism, and that is the turn of a number of newspapers that have been owned by chains into local businesses. Barbara, for example, was the editor of a Gannett newspaper, which now is the largest chain in the country, has been for a long time, more than 100 newspapers. Ira and I both have been at newspapers that were owned by large groups. And now there is some effort at some small newspapers. I think, of, for example, Gannett owned a little tiny paper down in Arkansas, where my parents lived in their retirement. And Gannett has sold the newspaper to the woman who had been working there for 33 three years as ad director, general manager, and and they're figuring out how to make it work. These local people say, we can do this if we don't have to send off cash to the corporate parent. And I wonder if that model has resonance for us, if there's a way that that can work. For example, uh, Ira, if your paper, if the Daily Freeman in Kingston didn't have corporate ownership, what would it lose? Why wouldn't it be a thriving local business? What benefit comes from ownership by that hedge fund that owns that newspaper group now? 
Well, really? the question comes with a supposition that if, in fact, a private ownership purchased that newspaper, how much money are they willing to invest in it initially, and how much money, if at all, are they willing to lose if their investment doesn't work? Certainly, the profit margin is important to the corporate newspaper owners, and newspapers historically have had obscenely high profit margins. So you could cut a newspaper's profit margin if it's not going to a corporate entity and still do fairly well. But you would also have to start putting back a lot of money into the product for people for various things that have been let go over the years. So I I think the short answer to your question, as they say in the adult diaper commercials, is it depends. I think each newspaper is different. (laughs) And, you know, in, in the late 80s, Newspapers were never more successful than they were at that time. The revenue was sky high, readership was sky high, and employment was sky high. And the downturn of newspapers occurred while all of those things were going on. In other words, when the newspaper business started failing, it had not yet delved into cutting newsroom population, and it had not stopped covering a lot of things that you never see in the papers anymore. Yet the circulation was going down. Why? Because the emerging new businesses of the Internet, the emerging importance of cable, in many cases because of weekly newspapers filled a void. So uh, it's not going to be so simple anymore to get that back. So are you pronouncing the death sentence, Ira? Well, we all have pronounced the death sentence. The only question has been how many years. I, I don't predict the death sentence of the newspaper business. I do predict the death sentence of print newspapers. I think it's interesting. You know, there's a lot of talk about how the weekly newspapers are filling their products with everything that many people believe they should, which is local names, local faces, local stories. Yet the weekly newspaper industry is in worse shape than the daily newspaper industry in terms of closed publications. So I'm not sure how they get that back. In Chicago, the Chicago Sun-Times, which has had a tough time as the number two newspaper in Chicago for a long time, has announced that it will join forces with WBEZ Public Radio. The Sun-Times will become a not-for-profit. And right away, between WBEZ Public Broadcasting and the Sun-Times, they'll have a huge newsroom with both a broadcast, a print, and a digital platform. And I think if they can pull that off, I think it could be a model for newsrooms going forward. What does that sound like to you, Alan, uh, you executive of public broadcast? I'll tell you. I'll tell you, Rex. If Mr. Hurst, who runs uh, your old newspaper, comes to see me, door's always open. He's more than welcome. All he has to do is assure me that he'll go to a not-for-profit standard. But I, I would welcome him. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's an interesting notion. Maybe you'll get Barbara's old publisher first. Maybe you'll have an opportunity. Barbara, what would happen if, do you think Saratoga Springs, for example, could support a locally owned newspaper? Oh, from your lips to God's ears. Uh, (laughs) We haven't been able to. So far, there was an interest in people buying the newspaper the last time that it turned around, but they couldn't come up with enough money. You have to remember that even if something is a not-for-profit, as Alan knows from their very successful completion of the latest fund drive, it still costs money. You might be running on a shoestring, but you still have to be making money to operate. You're just maybe not paying taxes. There's certain expenses you don't have. But I would have loved to see local people, maybe depending on the local people, own this newspaper. And I, I am skeptical of Gannett when they say, although it is new management nowadays, They have an executive from Gannett saying that they've been approached by prospective buyers from some of their local papers and carefully considered what was best for both our company and the community. And it's hard for me to not call that out as BS, where they're going to do what's best for their company. They're not necessarily going to be doing what's best for their community. I can't believe it. And yet, they had examples of local people buying those local newspapers and figuring out how to make a go of it. And Alan, I don't want to get hung up on that it has to be a print newspaper. They don't have to be print newspapers. Younger people are not looking at print at all. Right. We still call it a newspaper or a news organization, a news company. Yeah, uh, I agree and, with that. And it works. I agree it with that. Work. And that dramatically calls for less money than trying to uh, print and deliver. Well, you know, it's interesting, Barbara. We had a guy move into Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and set up a newspaper. And it seemed to be quite successful until they closed it up. I think there was a period of, you know, this could be done. And I think a lot of people are getting very depressed about the whole thing. And that, you know, maybe newspapers as papers 
But Rex has raised an interesting idea that necessity is the mother of invention. The fact is that sometimes when things aren't going well, people reach out and make a change. And that's when Rex is talking about the combination of public radio station and the number two newspaper. Those are the things that happen and that we should be keeping our eyes on. Well, some I of the people it's... taking over these operations are discovering, oh, it costs money more than they thought, money to invest in staffing especially, sure. to produce news that will work. I was right from the get-go. They have to invest in staff. And sometimes they may not realize how difficult that is to have anything of substance. If you have money, I, I guarantee you, I have no inside knowledge, but I guarantee you, if you are in a community and you're interested in the local newspaper that's owned by a hedge fund or otherwise corporately owned, if you're interested in buying it, they'll listen to you. I think the trend of local ownership is interesting to me because I don't see that being widespread. But if, if in fact, this all interests you, there's lots of opportunities around. And by the way, if you recall, the unions are particularly interested in getting local ownerships because they see what's happened under corporate ownerships, and they have actively gone out and tried to find would-be buyers and have not, by and large, have not been successful. So I'm not sure that the trend that we're starting off this segment with is really a trend. One other interesting notion that has been advanced out there is for local public libraries to become actually hubs of journalism, that this is a not-for-profit existing taxpayer-supported entity, by the way. And if the library became a place that would produce local journalism, is that possible? Uh, of course, uh, you would end up with the head librarian being this great patronage job, you know, the local center of facts. <laughs> All kinds of problems emerge. But it's an interesting notion that warrants further conversation that's just now being discussed. We're out of time, sad to say, oh, no. uh, for this conversation. It's going to be an hour. There's, oh, well, there's so many topics we could get to. Alan Shartok, Ira Fussfeld, Barbara Lombardo, and I'm Rex Smith. Thanks so much to our producer, Dave Gustina, for bringing all this interesting stuff to our attention. And thanks to you folks for joining us this week once again on The Media Project. All together fits the bill. Oh, newspaper men are such interesting people. It's wonderful to represent the bill. The Media Project is a production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. Alan Shartok is CEO of WAMC, Professor Emeritus at the State University of New York, commentator, columnist, and author. Rex Smith is editor-at-large of the Times Union. Barbara Lombardo is a journalism professor at the University at Albany and former executive editor of the Saratogian and the Troy Record. And Ira Fussfeld is the publisher emeritus of The Daily Freeman. You can listen to or podcast The Media Project anytime at wamc.org or just download the WAMC app for your iPhone or Android at the Play Store today. Thanks for listening. Readers get that payoff. What a headache, what a mess. Oh, publishers are such interesting people. Let's give free cheers for freedom of the press.